Welcome back, folks, to Hashtag Ask GSM here today. I'm Graham GSM Matthews. Episode 96, we are quickly closing in the big, historic 100th episode milestone, which should be coming in in about four weeks, so I guess a month from today, 97, 98, 99, and episode 100. Whatever, whatever date that falls on, I have no idea, but we are quickly closing in on that historic milestone. All thanks to you guys and sending in your questions, um, where every single week I answer your questions right here in this video forum from Facebook, YouTube, and the Twitter. And if you want to send in a question, you can tweet me on the Twitter, at WrestleRant with the hashtag AskGSM. <clears throat> You can find me on Facebook. Give the page an old thumbs up at facebook.com backslash gram.gsm.matthews. Leave a question on the post I usually put up on Sunday nights, or you can leave a question on the wall post itself, or you can uh, just leave a comment on this very video. I'll be sure to include your question in next week's edition. So like I said last week at the start of last week's edition, I am using a new program to record these videos. Windows Movie Maker, which I know is the absolute shit, but I'm just a basic pleb like that. I just use the basic of the basic. Whatever pumps out videos, I will use it. I'm not dishing out any money to buy a new program, or at least not right now. Um, but anyway, that just shit the bed on me, so I'm using another program. And last week when I recorded the video, because it was just one long take, which I usually do anyway, and it went almost an hour, I guess, I don't know, just somewhere along the way, it went out of sync between the video and the audio. I don't know if it's because of the new program, or it's because... Um, like I said, it was because it was one long take or because I did widescreen. I have no idea. So this week, we're not doing widescreen, which doesn't make that big of a difference anyway. And um, to kind of prevent that measure, I mean, it was fine when I did the video blog on Friday. I did a full 20-minute video talking about the top five returns that I want to see in WWE. Cheap plug if you want to check that video out before you watch this one. Um, I did one long take for that, and I had no issue. Or at least I don't think so when I watched it back. So um, we're going to try to chop this one up into like maybe 10, 20-minute interval, intervals. So I'll just throw that out there right now. But nevertheless, though, let's get to you guys' questions, starting with Hector S. from the YouTube. His question was, what is your favorite Sam Roberts podcast with a wrestler? So I love Sam Roberts. I think the guy is a great podcaster, great professional broadcaster, as he likes to call himself. Um, easily one of my favorite non-wrestling personality podcast to listen to along with the Solid Monster, both of whom I have met before. Both are great guys. Um, Sam Roberts, you can check out his stuff here on YouTube, on his podcast, which goes up every single Wednesday. All of his interviews are great. Everyone from Tatanka to Chris Jericho, I've enjoyed them all. Um, that's how entertaining he is. That's how personal he is with his interviewees. Um, all of the wrestlers that he talks to. Even like he's so great of, of a uh, of an interviewer that I watch all this stuff that he does with non-wrestlers, with like celebrities that I've never even heard before. I watch those on his YouTube channel. But anyway, um, yeah, all of his interviews are great, so it's kind of hard to pinpoint a certain one. I enjoyed his ones with The Miz and CM Punk, just more so because um, you know those are my favorites and Ryback as well. But um, probably the most entertaining interviews of his to listen to are the ones that he does with Paul Heyman. They're such great friends. And they have such amazing chemistry together is that basically the podcasts, nothing are being said, but it's still entertaining as all hell. Because Paul Heyman just basically for the entire hour busts Robert's balls the entire time. It's so great. Um, they just play off each other so, so well. So be, be sure to check out one of those interviews. Um, he just did one recently right over SummerSlam weekend on the YouTube channel. I'm pretty sure it's on his podcast as well. So if you've never seen any of his work before, be sure to check it out. That was a great interview along with the rest of his, uh, the interviews that he does on his podcast and on YouTube. So also from YouTube, the first KFC, their first question was, do Jason Jordan and Chad Gable have potential on the main roster? Absolutely. From the get-go, I have been praising these guys nonstop. They're awesome. These guys are the second coming, and I'm not the first one to say this, but these guys are the first coming, or the second coming, rather, of the world's greatest tag team, Shelton Benjamin and Charlie Haas, and it goes far beyond the fact that one is black and one is white. It goes far beyond that. Chad Gable is like a young Kurt Angle, and again, not the first one to say this. A lot of people have said this, but you look at not only his just his look in general with the singlet and his in-ring ability, but his charisma. The guy is great. The ready, willing, and gable rally towels and stuff, those are going to sell big if they start selling those in NXTshop.com or WWE Shop, whatever the hell it is that they sell the NXT merchandise at. They're great. They're going to sell big in front of the uh, Full Sail University guys, so that crowd. So I would definitely start selling those soon. I'm sure they will. I'm, I'm sure they're going to sell a ton more of those than they did for Ricky Ortiz. And anyone who, who recognizes that reference, I applaud you because that guy was on TV for like all of six months back in 08 or 09. So if you watched ECW back in 2008, then you would know who he is. But nevertheless, I do think Jason Jordan and Chad Gable are a great tandem. Chad Gable, I mean, Jason Jordan... 
took some time for me to warm up to him. I never really thought he was all that special. He just kind of screamed bland to me. I've talked about it in past videos, you know, go back a year ago and here on the channel. I would talk about Dillinger and Jordan. They just didn't really do it for me as a team. Both were very talented, but from a personality standpoint, Jordan didn't have any charisma, but now it seems like he's finally coming into his own as a character. But Chad Gable's already there. That guy is awesome, but I think these guys can be a true cornerstone of the tag team division, not only in NXT, but WWE, hopefully sooner rather than later. I mean, they should win the NXT tag team titles first. Then again, you know, um, Enzo and Colin have them, but I still feel like they should be on the main roster right now, but I digress. They're a great tandem. I feel like they have a lot of potential to be very successful on the main roster when they eventually get there. His second question, what is your favorite and least favorite Night of Champions opener? Um, favorite? I mean, I was looking back in all the openers in Night of Champions history. None of them really screamed like, wow, that was amazing. Because It might have been you who asked that same question right before SummerSlam. And, I mean, there were some good, ma like, there were some great matches that opened up SummerSlam over the last 25 years. I mean, granted, SummerSlam has been going on for over 25, almost 30 years at this point, and Night of Champions we've only had for about seven or eight years, but the point still stands. In those eight years, we have not had a, like, a, a mind-blowing, amazing match to kick off Night of Champions. From what I can recall, looking back at the results and stuff, but if I had to choose of all the openers that have happened at Night of Champions... Probably the one between Kofi Kingston and Dolph Ziggler from the 2010 Night of Champions installment, um, that No Holds Barred match. No, I don't think it was No Holds Barred. It might have been. I feel like it was if Ziggler just got DQ'd or counted out, he would have lost the belt. But, I mean, those guys have had a million matches together. They had a long series of matches that summer from, like, July to September. A like, almost every single week they were facing each other on SmackDown. But it was hard to complain when their matches were always so good. And this was easily the best of the bunch. A very, very good match to kick off the show. And... Probably my favorite Night of Champions installment ever. I mean, that was the second pay-per-view I ever bought as a fan. I just thoroughly enjoyed watching it. I'm probably going to be watching it at some point this weekend before the pay-per-view. But, um, yeah, probably that's my favorite Night of Champions opener in the history of the event. Lee's favorite? Again, I mean, there weren't really many, as, for as many mind-blowing matches that we had to open Night of Champions, which is basically none from what I can recall, there really haven't been too many bad ones either. I mean, we've had some decent matches. I wouldn't call them, like, the worst um, but your wording is the least favorite. So probably, I mean, if I had to choose, probably John Morrison and Miz versus Finley and Hornswoggle. Again, not a bad match. I kind of enjoyed it for what it was. Um, just not as much as some of the other openers that included, what was it in 2013? I think it was Axel and Kingston, Curtis Axel and Kofi Kingston for the IC title. Good match there. What was it last year? Cesaro and Sheamus would probably actually might be my favorite opener. That was an amazing match. Or no, that wasn't the opener. It was the tag team title match. That's what it was. Uh, but yeah, we had a lot of good matches on this show. Um, I mean, we had a lot of good matches at Night of Champions. The least favorite would probably be Finley and Hornswoggle versus Miz and Morrison from the 08 Night of Champions. It just, I mean, I was going to write this in an article, then I just kind of kiboshed it. But, you know, Hornswoggle almost beating a future WWE champion in The Miz. That's how... Uh, that, that's what the comparison was back in 2000. I mean, at, at that, that point, they never knew that Miz would go on to become as big of a start as he did in 2010. But um, very strange, very strange. I don't think I needed to, I didn't need to see Hornswoggle as tag team champion, or at least considered a legitimate threat to the tag team champions. Uh, Frank Ashier, 15, their question was, should Mark Henry go into the WWE Hall of Fame next year? Um, it depends on when he retires, which I, w depends on when he retires, which I've talked about here on the show before. Um, will that be anytime soon? It's anyone's guess. I mean, he just said recently, I wrote an article about it for Bleach Report, that he plans on retiring at some point in the next year. He looks to wind down his career at some point in the very near future. But he's been saying that for years, though. You can go back to interviews that he did in 2011, 2012, 2013, last year. He keeps on saying all the time that he's going to be retiring like, oh, I'm going to retire in the next year. I mean, nothing against Mark Henry, but the guy's always saying, I'm going to retire in the next year, and he doesn't retire. So I wouldn't take his word for it this time. And, I mean, seeing is believing with Mark Henry. Um, but WrestleMania 32 will be emanating from his native Texas, so I could see why it would be fitting. I mean, there's so many other people I would induct before Mark Henry, at least right now. Henry is, will certainly be Hall of Fame worthy, in my opinion, at some point. You know, he is Hall of Fame worthy just to induct him as soon as next year. I mean, I could see it for the Texas element, but... He's not done yet. It's not like Edge or Michaels where they needed to get them in ASAP because both of them are like guaranteed Hall of Fame and you know worthy inductors. By that margin, you know we should have gotten like you know Christian should be in the Hall of Fame by right now. By now, if he's not already retired, I mean if he is retired, whatever. But you know what I mean. So I feel like will he go into the Hall of Fame? I don't think so. Should he go into the Hall of Fame? 
I would wait until a couple years down the line. You know, I would like put him in with the like the regals and the gold dusts and stuff like that. The, and a Booker T's already in. Um, but people like that, I mean, a lot of people might say, oh, they're not you know worthy of being inducted to the Hall of Fame. It, the criteria for the WWE Hall of Fame is so skewed; it's really all subjective, and who deserves it and who doesn't. So I th- I feel like Mark Henry is worthy at some point. As soon as next year, I, I wouldn't rush that just yet. He's still part of the active roster. And before you give me the Ric Flair comparison from OE, he was still part of the roster when he was inducted. It's Ric Flair and Mark Henry. So just con- con- consider who you're comparing there for a second. Um, his second question: Should Mark Henry? No, I'm on, still on the Mark Henry thing. Should Eric Rowan return, or when he should? When should Eric Rowan return? Um, I feel like he's still injured. I mean, people are saying like, "Oh, he, why isn't he here right now? Is he, he's being buried by management, and you know that's why they're not including him in his wife family shit." I feel like he's he's still injured. I mean, otherwise he would be back by now. They're not going to hold him off TV for no reason. I mean, they probably have no plans for him, but I feel like he's still injured. Unless he comes back tonight as the third guy, which I can't see being a possibility. I don't want to see, honestly. I've talked about that before here on the show, maybe last week. Eric Rowan, if anything, when he comes back, should be a part of the Wyatt family. There is no rule that says the Wyatt family needs to be three members. They can have a Ravens Flock-esque group where they have more than a couple guys in it. I mean, not like to the NWO limits where it's like a million people, half the rosters in the Wyatt family. But with four people, I don't see, I don't see a reason why they can't put him back in. He was teaming with Harper before he got injured anyway, so I don't see any reason why they can't. I mean, why it wouldn't make sense. It's not like he was feuding with Harper, feuding with Harper before he got injured, before he went down with the injury. So, yeah, I would put him back in the group when he gets back. And, uh, yeah, I just see no reason to have him team with Ambrose and Reigns. There's no chemistry there. Rowan is not that good where people like will mark out if he's um, the third guy, if he's revealed as the, the big mystery partner for the former Shield members. I just see no reason to... Uh, to do that. So have him return whenever he's healthy. I feel like, you know, right now he is not ready to return. I think a lot of people don't understand that. Maybe he is ready. And maybe I'm missing something. But as far as I know, he is still injured. And the timetable for his return was like November or something like that. So we'll have to wait and see. But I wouldn't return. I wouldn't have bring him back until he is 100% healthy and just put him back with the Wyatt family. Uh, moving now into the Facebook questions. We've got a couple questions. Mark S. sent in like 10 questions. I'm not going to answer that many questions, but I did pick two of his um, that I thought I would answer. His first one being, who should be the third member with Roman Reigns and Dean Ambrose? Who deserves it? And who should add, who would add most to the team? So basically going from that question to this one, perfect tie-in, perfect segue, I guess I should say. Um, yeah, not Eric Rowan. Not Eric Rowan. Um, in my personal opinion, I just feel like that would be a major disappointment. You know, RJ has pitched Baron Corbin. I was not fully convinced of that at first, but he did uh, win me over with that idea, with just the booking of it, and you missed it. If you if you missed his idea, I read it off last week on the show here on Hashtag SGSM. We talked about it on WrestleRant Radio. There's a clip of it here on the channel. There's plenty of, plenty of places to listen to it, so I'm not going to repeat it here. But Baron Corbin would be fine. I mean, if he's... Not going to be, I mean, if he's going to be a heel at some point, I could see that. Just as like a, a lone, a loner babyface, it's not going to work because the NXT people turned on him pretty quickly. Um, but yeah, Baron Corbin would be, would be fine. Randy Orton, I would love to see. I feel like I, we still don't know if he's going to be the third guy based off the attack last week or not. I mean, I've been saying that for weeks now. Randy Orton should be the third guy just because for what it would mean for a future feud with Bray Wyatt. Now, that would be awesome. And the chemistry he would have with Ambrose and Reigns would be great. He would be a great addition to the team. But as RJ said when he was pitching his idea to me, that it really all comes down to whoever the third guy is being a legitimate threat to Braun Strowman. That's exactly what all of this is about. Finding someone to match counterpart um, Braun Strowman. And Randy Orton would get easily destroyed at Braun Strowman, as we saw last week on Raw. So it has to be... Some sort of monster, or, you know, if it's like a fucking Santino-level guy, then what's the point? Just so we can get pinned, that makes absolutely no sense. Ambrose and Reigns are not that dumb. So it has to be someone that's credible, and um, I would go with Randy Orton. Again, wouldn't make that much sense, but I would go with Orton just for the great match aspect of it that we can get at Night of Champions. And, yeah, either Orton or Corbin right now. I mean, no one else really makes that much sense. Apollo Crews, way too soon. Would mark the hell out, but way too soon. Samoa Joe, kind of the same thing. He's going to be feeding with Finn Balor pretty soon, I'm sure. So, um, yeah, I would say one of the two between uh, Baron Corbin or Randy Orton. Second question, should a title change occur on SmackDown? Would it be good for the show? I feel like the last title change we got on SmackDown... 
I want to say was when Del Rio won the World Heavyweight Championship on like the first episode, first or second episode of 2013. So almost two and a half, three years ago at this point. It's not surprising that we haven't gotten one since because SmackDown is essentially dead. I mean, I watch SmackDown. Many people don't. I just review it from my website. I enjoy it more often than not, but that's just because I'm a fucking mark. Um, but yeah, just there's no reason for it. I don't think a title change occurring on SmackDown would really do anything to boost the show's numbers. I mean, we saw a title change on main event when the show first happened. They made the show out to be a big deal for a while, and then it just went to the wayside. They're never consistent with any other show but Raw um, in terms of how important it is and where it ranks among, um, among the best shows in the company. Other than NXT, which you can consider is not a main roster program, I'm talking about Superstars, SmackDown, main event. All of those shows were treated as big deals. Even ECW were all big deals when they debuted. And they just went to shit because they stopped caring about it. Once the, once the numbers just barely you know, start to flounder just a little bit, they just give up. That's what Vince's motto is. Oh, you know, just barely not doing well. He doesn't hold out hope. He doesn't try to put more effort into it. He just fucking gives up. And um, I'm not a fan of that approach, but that's what they've done with all their shows. I don't think a title changing on SmackDown would really do anything to make people care about the show. I mean, even if they brought it to USA Network next year, I mean, that'd be a perfect opportunity to make the show mean something again. But they had that opportunity earlier this year when they went to Thursday nights, and they still didn't do anything with it. We got a casket match in the first episode. We got some big matchups for the first month, and that was it. They basically just stopped giving a shit about the show after a while, which was unsurprising. A lot of people saw that coming. It's disappointing because I feel like SmackDown could be a great supplement to Raw and whatever you don't get in on Raw, which is impossible because the show is three hours, but nevertheless, SmackDown could be a great show for where you can further storylines that are not furthered on Raw. If you don't want to bring back the brand split, that'd be the perfect use of SmackDown for right now. They don't want to do that. A title changing on SmackDown, title changing hands on SmackDown, I don't think would do anything to change that as we saw in 2013 with the Del Rio situation. People cared about SmackDown for a week and then it went back to meaning nothing. Moving along here to the Twitter questions. First from at WeGaza47, their question was, GM mode or universe mode, please explain. So I made no bones about it, GM mode for life. Um, universe mode is not bad. I, it's cool that they have as many specifics as they do, all like you don't know what's going to happen and stuff like that. But at the same time, that aspect of it can be a huge detractor to the mode for me personally because I like to be in control like if you were running a W like if you were running WWE I like to be surprised um, but I don't want someone to get injured like something like that I mean I know it's realistic in that sense but I don't want someone to turn heel like I'm not I don't want to do like a let's say a Finn Balor and John Cena tag team I don't want Finn Balor to turn heel on John Cena halfway through if I want them to win the titles and that just randomly happens I mean surprises are cool but when it's something completely unrealistic it makes no sense and it just pisses me off and I have to backtrack and do stuff like that. It's just not fun. And there's also a very um, a limit as to how much you could play with that game because there's no brand split. There's no. I mean, I think there is a draft still. I know they had it with a couple of, couple years ago in the game. I haven't played it since, so I really have no idea. Um, just from what I can gather and what from I have played, uh, you know, from the game. GM mode. It's just so much like that era in wrestling that most of us loved. I'm not going to say all of us, but most of us loved. With the Raw and SmackDown aspect of it, trading superstars back and forth, doing the draft every year, doing the um, cross-promotion pay-per-views at SummerSlam, Raw and SmackDown at the Rumble. like Stuff like that is awesome. And I, that game came out fucking, you know, SmackDown vs. Raw 2007 came out in oh, 2007 and 2006. <laughs> Brain fart there for a second. And I still play that game. I bought that game in, I think, in 2009 fucking seven, six years ago, and I still play that to this day with John, because the game is so great, there's so many endless possibilities, with people turning heel, moving them to Raw, moving them to SmackDown, taking them off the roster completely, there are endless possibilities with that game, that you just don't have with Universe Mode, you just play it for like a week or two, and then you get bored, because you can't even go back and look at all the results that you did, and if you want to write those down, it just takes too much effort, in GM Mode, you have all your results up to a year, so, and I wrote, an whole, I wrote a whole article about that, so you can check that out for, you know, further explanation, it's on What Culture, I wrote it about a month ago, explaining 10 reasons why General Manager Mode should be brought back in, in replacing Universe Mode, because I think it is 10 times more superior to Universe Mode. Our next question comes from at Prince Pretty seventy seven. Their question was, "Do you think Sasha Banks versus Bailey at the next NXT Takeover could be better than Trish Stratus versus Alita?" Excellent question. I definitely think there's a chance of that happening. Now, Trish Stratus and Alita were the cornerstones of the Divas Division. Let's 
face it. It was the women's division when they were wrestling. Um, back in the early 2000s to the mid-2000s. And, but, I mean, they had some great matches. Like the, but then again, I was watching Unforgiven 2006. Not their best match. I've seen some of their past encounters. Um, their final match ever, Unforgiven 06. The night True Stratus retired and won the belt from Lita. Very good match. Fucking pales in comparison to Bailey versus Sasha Banks. Maybe I'm just wearing rose-colored glasses or whatever the phrase is. Maybe I'm just being biased because I love NXT so much and I was there for that match. But honestly, you watch both matches back and tell me which one is better. Trish Stratus and Lita had the character development that is not seen in the women's division today. NXT women's division has that same character development that matches them to Trish Stratus and Lita. They are on that same level in that respect, in my personal opinion. Um, but they also just had history. They feuded... For years, their first match they had in like fucking 2002, 2001. They feuded for on and off for four and five years, and maybe people got bored of it. I don't know. I wasn't a fan at that time, but they continued to have great matches regardless of what role either woman was playing. And in this specific scenario with Bailey and Sasha Banks, they too have history, not as long as Trish and Lee. Then maybe if they continue wrestling for the next couple of years, which I'm sure they they should and they and they could. Um, they they do have history right now, you know, dating back to when they both debuted in 2013 in NXT, and they had matches even back then. So you look at how far they've come, both of them since then, their evolution of their characters, and you know, as many people have said, as I have said in the past as well, the match from NXT Takeover Brooklyn, the best women's match in WWE history. Name me a better women's match than Bailey and Sasha Banks. There is none. There is none. Not even Trish Stratus and Lita. Those two women had the history. Their matches were very good. This match was exceptional. And I think the next match at the NXT TakeOver, um, the, the, the next match at their TakeOver special in October, the Iron Woman match, the Iron Man match, Iron Maiden match, as the Solo Monster referred to it as, which I thought was pretty pretty clever. Um, whatever you want to call it, it's going to I mean, someone else asked me a question about it, and I'll talk about it in a few minutes. But, um... Yeah, I think this well definitely could be better than any Trish and Lita match we've ever seen. Um, because their match at Brooklyn was fantastic. 95% of people that I've talked to have said the same thing. And I feel like this match is going to be just probably one of the best matches of the year. Banks and Bailey already had one of the best matches of the year already. Um, but I feel like this rematch could possibly top it. It's really hard to with the title change, the environment, the build-up, everything about that match. But the rematch... Could be something special, and I'm looking forward to it. And I'll talk about that more in a second. Someone else, someone else asked me my thoughts on that match, and I'll, so I'll you know go more in depth of that in a few minutes. Um, the next question comes from at Swags. The other question was, "What is your favorite battle royal?" Well, wow, that's a good question, um, and it's a very hard question too because not many battle royals are worth watching. Um, just a lot of them are trash. I'm trying to think of like. With the exception of Royal Rumbles, Battle Royals are very, like, rarely good. Rarely good. I remember marking out or, you know, just going crazy over when William Regal won the Battle Royal to become the new number one contender to the Intercontinental title. I think it it was the week before it was in England. That's where he won the belt. And I think it was the week before that. And it was just completely came out of the blue um, because he wasn't really doing anything at that time. So to see him become the new number one contender, I was like, oh, I was so happy. The match itself was kind of poop. <laughs> um, but... Seeing him win was pretty cool. Other than that, I can't think of any other battle royals that I was truly invested in. Maybe there's a couple of others, a couple of others that I'm not thinking of right now. Um, just most battle royals are just very throwaway up until like the last couple of minutes. The one at the Great American Bash 2012, not the pay per view. It wasn't a pay per view at that point. They had a special on SmackDown, the Tuesday special. That I thought was very well constructed. You furthered a few feuds between um, Punk and. Um, Brian at that time, Punk and Brian. A few other feuds, maybe John Cena and Kane or something like that. It came down to Kane and Zack Ryder, who obviously had a lot of history. In the end, Ryder winning. I mean, the biggest win, he has not gotten a bigger win since then. That was three years ago. That was after he won the U.S. title, but and he became SmackDown GM for like, a, for like a night. But it was an awesome moment. Thoroughly enjoyed that. Really enjoyed that match. That's the only battle royal that comes to mind that really stands out as being like truly... Not, it wasn't even a great match. Just the outcome and just the... Suspense towards the end was awesome. But that's the last time I can remember being truly invested in a battle royal. That comes to my memory anyway. Um, next question, also from Matt Swagzio. If Jeff Hardy returned to WWE, who would you like to see him feud with? A lot of people. <coughs> There's a lot of people on the list. I'm hoping to make a, an article about this at some point. 
whether it be for Bleach Report or Hidden Remote or whatever, whatever, whatever website, and at least in the next week or so, um, 10 opponents for a potentially returning GF Hard. I'm not saying he's returning soon, but I think he will be back at some point, no doubt about it, especially after all the name drops we got from Jeff Hardy last week on WWE TV and just all the reports that I've been reading. He will be back at some point. So when he does come back, I don't want to see him work a full schedule. I've talked about that before. I feel like he doesn't need to work a full schedule. He's an attraction. He's super popular. If you can have RVD and Jericho only work Raws and SmackDowns. I mean, Jericho works house shows now, but it's only because he doesn't do TV. Um, but if you had just him, if you had him work just the Raws and SmackDowns in the pay-per-views, that's completely okay. There is no reason for, to have Jeff Hardy work the house shows. Absolutely no reason his body is beat up beyond belief. I'm pretty sure WWE knows that. But he can still go. I've seen in TNA, he could still have a very, very good match with the right opponent. And just um, if he's not injured, so uh, if he's not beat up. But yeah, a lot of people. Seth Rollins is one that comes to mind. I know John, at underscore John Stargan on the Twitter. He uh, tweeted out over the weekend that a Seth Rollins match and uh, Jeff Hardy match would change the business. And it would be indeed a fantastic match that I would love to see. So Rollins and Jeff Hardy because... Let's face it, Rollins is like the Jeff Hardy of 2015. So is Finn Balor. That's another match I would love to see. Just take my money now. I'm throwing it to you on the screen. Take my fucking money. That match would be a dream match come true. But, yeah, him and Rollins, him and Finn Balor, it's just... You know, Seth Rollins is not exactly the Jeff Hardy because he could play a better heel than Jeff Hardy ever could in TNA for, like, the six months that he was a heel before he got himself canned or suspended or whatever. <laughs> the infamous... Victory Road incident in 2011. Another story for another day. But Rollins, he, you know, I feel like as great of a heel as he is right now, he's going to be even better babyface, which is scary because he's a great heel right now. I think it's going to be it's scary great when he finally turns heel. Um, rather babyface at some point down the line. Maybe as soon as this year, like as soon as later this year when he splits from the authority, hopefully, and we can finally get that babyface Seth Rollins. His... In-ring offense screams heel anyway. The guy is like the current Jeff Hardy, just with a lot better mic skills, in my opinion. But yeah, Finn Balor, Rollins, Kevin Owens, Samoa Joe, they had a few matches in, um, in, in TNA for a while. Never really were able to have a full feud, I don't think, but they had some good matches. We'd love to see that in WWE. Um, I think a John Cena feud would be cool, too. John Cena is quickly running out of fresh feuds. And a Jeff Hardy feud, as weird as that sounds, a Hardy and Cena feud has never been done before. I think they had one match on my birthday in 2008, June 2nd. It was a number one contenders match, and the winner went out the net of champions to face Triple H of the United for the uh, WWE Championship. And Cena won. I think clean, too. I'm pretty sure he won clean. To my memory, that was the only time that Cena ever had a match with Jeff Hardy, one-on-one -on -one anyway, which is shocking considering they were in the same company for six or seven years. <laughs> Um, no, Jeff Hardy left for a while, but you still know what I mean, though. He, you know, for all the years that Cena was on top and Jeff Hardy was popular, they never did a full-fledged feud between the two. I don't know how that would work, because Jeff Hardy is so much more popular than Je and then John Cena, and you have two baby faces. But that didn't stop him from doing it with CM Punk back in 2011 or Daniel Bryan in 2013. So I see no reason why they can't do that match when Hardy returns at some point, hopefully in the next year. Um, next question comes from at E13A. How much are you looking forward to the Iron Woman match at NXT TakeOver? Dude, I am super thrilled. Like, you have no idea. When I went on WWE.com, I went on there to, like, look for a picture or something for an article that I was doing. And just on the homepage, I see this picture with Banks and with uh, Bailey and Sasha on it. And I'm thinking, okay, is this the preview for NXT this week or what is this, you know? Uh, maybe for their next match, the next pay-per-view, or whatever. Maybe they're having a rematch next week in NXT. What is this? So I look at the picture, and it says Iron Man match. 30-minute Iron Man match in the fucking main event. It didn't say fucking, but I'm adding that in myself. In the main event of NXT TakeOver in October. And I went nuts. I, like, tweeted, you know, completely illegible words, like illegible letters and words in my Twitter for like two or three tweets, two or three tweets before going nuts in all caps saying like, holy shit, this is actually happening. That is something that you would book in, I don't know, a video game or something like that. Never anything I thought we would ever see in WWE. Um, the fact that it's going to be at NXT TakeOver in the main event. Like you, I don't know if you understand this. The women have never main event today in an NXT TakeOver show before, which is something that I was very afraid of. Because after that amazing match at Brooklyn, which a lot of people said should have closed the show, and now it makes much more sense why they didn't close the show, because um, you're saving that for the next special. But my biggest fear was, did they miss the boat on having the women main event NXT TakeOver? Because the current crop of women 
are not nearly as good as the four horse women are. Um, you know, Eva and Carmela and Alexa Bliss, they're decent. They are not there yet. They are not even close to being there yet, not having the same caliber of matches those women would have, um, you know, at some point. So, still, uh, anyway, yeah, so I think those two are going to have easily one of, if not the best match of the year. Personally, to, to date, my favorite match of, of 2015 has been Cena and Owens from Elimination Chamber at the, yeah, the Elimination Chamber pay-per-view, Cena and Owens, phenomenal match. You could say that match, the sequel to it, even the third match, maybe, I don't know about the third match, but that was still a pretty good match in its own right. The triple threat from the Rumble, Roman Reigns and Brock Lesnar at WrestleMania, Taker and Lesnar, if you want to go there. There's so many matches that could be considered the match of the year. Banks and Bailey from um, TakeOver last month, and I think this match could match it. Like I said earlier, it's going to be hard to top it because that match was so great from the build to the moment to everything about that match was so fucking phenomenal. It's going to be so tough to top it, but if there's any two women that could top that match they had the first time around, it's Sasha Banks and Bailey. So moving along here to our next question on the list, um, also from at 313A, um, it, w it was, was Sting's antics with the Rollins statue out of character? And he said in parentheses, I can't see w WCW face Sting ever resorting to that. Yeah, it was a little out of character. I mean, it's a complete 180 from the Sting that we saw earlier this season. Not a bad thing. Like It's, it's not like I was annoyed by, the, um, by Sting's antics on Raw last week. I just thought it was weird. You know, it's, they're not ruining Sting. WWE is not ruining Sting. I don't want to hear that crap. If you want to make that argument, fine. I'm not going to listen to it because I don't think it's true. I think they've done just fine by him. He's not competing on superstars. Not like he would anyway, but it's not like... I mean, he lost to WrestleMania. Yes, I do agree that was a bad move, but everything else since then, everything else before that was so good, so great. The promos have been good. He's facing quality opponents. I can't complain. Uh, me personally, anyway. If you want to, If you want to disagree with that, that's completely okay. Um, but anyway, though, I feel like with the Sting antics on Raw last week, as a lot of people have said, I tweeted this out last week after Raw, very TNA Jokerish, very TNA Sting, Joker Sting, um, which I didn't like. A lot of people thought was good, like, oh, that was the best run he ever had in TNA. I hated Joker Sting, not because of my hate for TNA, like, I love TNA, but at that period in time, I, TNA was unbearable to watch in 2011, and Joker Sting was awful. I love the Joker, I love Sting. Combining the two, I thought was so stupid. And I thought Sting, while he showed personality, which is good, as opposed to just, you know, just standing there and not saying anything, just being quiet. I like that Sting. I like Crow Sting. I like the quiet Sting. If he talks, it's fine. I like the I like his promo skills too. I think he's come a long way as a as a promo guy um, since WCW. I think that, you know, TNA helped him in that respect and that he got a lot better as a mic worker. But Joker's thing I just thought was so stupid, and I'm hoping that last night, or last week rather, was a one-off occurrence, one-off appearance with the Joker's thing. We're back to the regular, very serious thing, maybe non-talking thing. I don't know if we'll ever go back to that, but at least the serious thing, I want to see that thing back, and the passionate thing, not the joking, you know, ha-ha, and hanging off the uh, garbage trucks thing. I'm just, I'm not a fan of that. I think it's, again, it's not going to ruin his character, but too much of it could be unbearable, like overbearing if they continue to do it. So hopefully that will not become the case. His third question, push repackage release. Always love these questions. Continue to send them in. Um, there's a lot of tough ones, especially this week, but um, remember to keep on sending these questions and I always love answering these on hashtag AskUSM. But his question was, we push repackage release Cesaro, Cody Rhodes, and Curtis Axel. This one was a lot easier than a lot of the other ones I got this week. I would push Cesaro, repackage Rhodes, Release Axel. Cesaro is in desperate need of a push right now. He should be main event, in my opinion. Um, Repackage Rhodes. I mean, Stardust, he's doing fine with the gimmick, but I just feel like there's so much more money in Cody Rhodes. And then Release Axel. I know a lot of people like Axel. I like Curtis Axel, but he is just... After pushing him, and I know it wasn't his fault that, that he just fucked up, that they fucked up the pairing with Paul Heyman and he lost to CM Punk every single week. I still feel like that was the downfall of his character. The fact that he was made to look like a loser against CM Punk every single fucking week for the entire latter half of 2013, that's what ruined him in my opinion. But he had an IC title run. They tried with him. It didn't work. The guy's hardly on TV. Just let him go. Of, the, of those three people, you can't make an argument otherwise. There is no way that I, that I would release Cody Rhodes and Cesaro over Axel. Any day of the week, that would not be the case. So pretty simple one. Push Cesaro, repackage Rhodes, and release Curtis Axel. At Cody Collier 37 
This question was, how many falls do you think the Iron Woman match at NXT TakeOver could go on October 7th? I mean, it could go like, you know, I know the Cena and Orton one, which was their last Iron Man match, Iron Man match on, um, you know, six years ago, which is crazy to think about. I just wrote an article for Bleach Report saying why WWE should bring back the Iron Man match. We are well overdue for an Iron Man, Iron Women match, whatever. Um, it's been so long, and I think these two women are the perfect people to bring it back with. Anyway, though, um, that match between Cena and Orton, I mean, Cena and Orton and Banks and Bailey are two very different um, sets of opponents, but... They went, I think, maybe five to four, six to five, like a lot of falls, almost ten falls in that match, and for an hour. That's different. This is thirty minutes. And if you think about it too, I hate matches where, like, for the two out of three count falls match. I always love those kind of matches, but I hate when they do the fall in like the first two or three minutes. That's like basically saying any of their other matches that they would have had against each other, it would have ended in two minutes. It makes no sense. Why would you do that? I understand they want to get the three falls, but. Space it out a little bit. Pretend like it's an actual match and give it 10, 15 minutes. Maybe have the second fall, you know, go a little short. But the first fall should not be under eight minutes, in my opinion. It's ridiculous considering who's involved. But anyway, in this, um, in this instance, Banks and Bailey had like a 25-minute match or something close to that NXT Takeover Brooklyn. So I can't see them doing like seven falls in a half an hour if their first match went almost 30 minutes and they had one fall in the entire thing. I would do what people have been comparing this matchup to to Michaels and Hart, in which they do no falls up until the very end. And unless they want to go sudden death, um, if they want to do sudden death, that's fine. They went over time with the NXT TakeOver special uh, in Brooklyn, so they can't. I see no reason why they can't do it again if they need to, if need be. Either do that or just have someone get the fall in like the last final minute. I, I, I mean, it would be fine if they went like, oh, you know, three to four, I'm beating you, whatever. I could see them doing that. That's completely okay. The match is going to be great regardless. But the better story to be told, in my opinion, is getting just one fall. One fall in the, in the entire 30 minutes. And Bailey gets it in the last, like, 30 seconds. Um, or, you know, Banks has her in, in the bank statement. She rolls her up for the pin. Gets the one, two, three. And retains the belt before the uh, clock can run out. So I, I would probably do that. I mean, again... Constant falls, I'm fine with that, but I just don't feel like it's all that realistic considering their first match went almost 25 minutes and they got one fall in the entire thing. Um, next match, or next question rather, comes from Matt Big Bird, 432. Their question was, who would you push, repackage, and release? Sami Zayn, Kevin Owens, and Finn Balor. Very tough one. Um, I mean, I love all these guys, so it's really hard to say. I'd probably push Balor. He is the most... I mean, him and Owens have star written all over them, but I feel like Balor is going to be the bigger moneymaker for the company, so I would push Balor. Um, repackage Owens. I mean, it's weird to say. I've talked about it here on the show in the past that I don't feel like he needs to be repackaged. He just needs to be um, just built back up. His gimmick is fine. He is just him. So there's no. I mean, all these guys have the gimmicks that they should have, so there's no reason to repackage any of them, but... Just for the sake of it, I think Owens and Zayn are kind of on the same level, but Owens, I feel like, can be a world champion. I feel like Zayn's size might get in the way of that, even though I do think he can be a big star for the company. So I would release Zayn regretfully and repackage Owens and push Balor. At Scarlet1 via the Twitter. Also a push repackage release question, and she's got three of them. Um, let's see here. Dean Ambrose, Seth Rollins, and Roman Reigns. So all of the three ones that they sent in, we're all um, groups. That's pretty cool. But yeah, the first one being Ambrose, Rollins, and Reigns. I know I've said in the past I would push Reigns or repackage Reigns or whatever. Um, but you know, it's just that he is not there yet. Rollins and Ambrose sell significantly more merch than he does. I know Reigns has the look, but he's just not clicking. Ambrose and Rollins are already there. I know Reigns, you're gonna build, you're gonna build him up to be the next guy of the company. But Ambrose and Rollins are already there. They're not the face of WWE, but they're much more popular and they're much more over and they're selling much more merchandise than Roman Reigns, and that's a fact. So I would push Ambrose, repackage Rollins into a babyface. You could any one of these guys, you could really switch or switch around. But you, know, you could repackage Ambrose into a heel, can continue to push Rollins. It really doesn't matter, and release Roman Reigns. But that's just the way that I would do it. Um, their second question, Becky Lynn, Charlotte, and Paige. Again, really, really tough, <coughs> uh, really tough to say. The push and release, you can flip flop around. I would repackage Charlotte. I feel like the babyface shtick has got to go. She's over as a babyface, but like the whole woo thing and just re, you know just regurgitating her father's lines. It's only gonna get her so far, so I would easily repackage her. 
I wrote down Push Lynch in Reilly's page only because Lynch is a fresher face. <clears throat> and while Paige has only been here for a year and a half, she's already been a two-time Divas champion. She's feuded with the Bella Twins like a thousand times. And maybe you can argue that Paige is better. She's more popular than Lynch. But I feel like Lynch is a bigger face, like a, a fresher face right now. And if, if we had to get rid of one of the three of them, it would probably be Paige. Um, I love Paige just because, but just because, you know, she's already been around for two years. She's not seemingly done it all, but she's had a WrestleMania match. She's a two-time Divas champion. She's done a lot more than Lynch has, and Lynch has a lot further to go, so I would push her and get rid of Paige. And their final question, Big E, Kofi Kingston, and Xavier Woods. A little easier. I would push Big E. I've always said that he could have been the first African-American WWE champion since The Rock. Um, in 2013, I mean, he won the title in 2013, but The Rock was the first and only African American WWE champion, not World Heavyweight champion. We had Booker T and Mark Henry for that belt, but for the WWE title, the only African American champion we've ever had was The Rock. Um, and I feel like Big E could have been the first black WWE champion since The Rock, but they just completely let him flounder. And he was a mid card; he was doing nothing for a while, and they finally found something for him to do in the in the New Day. At this point, now looking at him now, he's a glorified mid-card act. Very entertaining. I don't think he could be a world champion, um, you know, in retrospect. But I would push him. I would repackage Kingston just to be a, like a total heel like what he is now, but just maybe much more aggressive. And then release Woods. I like Xavier Woods. I was really happy when they signed him. I'm still a huge fan of Xavier Woods. I think he has great mic ability. But um, of the three, I don't think he has as much potential as um, Big E and Kofi Kingston do. Moving into our final set of questions here, also from at Scarlet One. What non-title matches could you see happening at Night of Champions? I wrote an article about this last week, and all the matches I thought were going to happen that were non-title have basically already been confirmed. Uh, Rusev and Ziggler I thought would be an intergender tag team match with Lana and Summer Rae. Lana got hurt, but we're still getting Ziggler and Rusev regardless. So that's a non-title match. Um, what was the other one that I wrote down? It was that match and... Oh, the six man, the um, Wyatt family, and then the Ambrose and Reigns match with their mystery partner. That's already been confirmed for the card too. So, I mean, I don't know what other matches they could do. Cesaro doesn't have a match. Miz doesn't have a match. Sheamus doesn't have a match. Orton maybe you can get thrown as as the third guy in that Wyatt family match. Unless they do an impromptu match between like Cesaro and Sheamus, I don't see what reason, um, like what other matches we can have on the card. I mean, I don't know. We're, we're gonna have five title matches. That's already been confirmed. Through the two non-title matches, and I don't think you need any other matches other than those. Maybe a kickoff match, but other than that, I think I feel like we're good. So um, I don't know. Just the matches that have already been confirmed: the Ziegler and Rusev match, and the six-man um, White Family Ambrose Reigns and Mystery Partner match. And their final question: a non-wrestling question. I mean, I'll take questions like this. I won't take like, "What are your thoughts on the economy right now?" Like, I'm not going to answer that kind of stuff. I'm not even. I don't even have an opinion on that kind of stuff anyway. You don't want to hear my thoughts on that, but. Stuff like this, I definitely will take questions for. Um, a question such as, are there any other TV programs or books that you like to follow? Um, any TV programs? I was a huge Monk and Psych fan, both of which aired in the USA Network. That's what got me into wrestling in the first place was the USA Network. My grandfather used to watch it a lot, and I used to watch it with him. So that's how I got into like Walker, Texas Ranger. I love that show, all the reruns they would air of that on USA Network. Monk and Psych, up until they both ended. Monk ended in 09, and then Psych ended just last year. I mean, I watched it all the time, all the new episodes. I have all the DVDs with all the seasons on them. Um, but yeah, I, definitely Monk and Psych were my favorite two, my, were my top two favorite TV shows. Other than those, though, I mean, I, since those two shows ended, I haven't watched really any TV at all. I only watch Raw on Mondays, and sometimes I don't even watch SmackDown on TV. I just watch them on like on you know a couple hours before because people upload them online and stuff. So. Um, just, you know, Raw and SmackDown for the most part for TV shows. I mean, I watched Ballers for a while. Of course, with The Rock, everything has to have some sort of related wrestling experience attached to it. But um, I, I could only watch at my dad's house because I didn't have HBO. He did. And I recorded. And I was only I was only there like every other week um, or every Wednesday or something like that. I just never had the time. I watched the first three episodes. I thought that was a very good show. Definitely check it out. I have to watch the rest of the season. Um, but that was the only other show that I really watched. I mean, I'm not a huge TV guy anyway. As far as books goes... Um, I only read wrestling autobiographies for the most part. I'll read a few other kind of books um, if they're good. Like, I'll read books for school and stuff, obviously. But other than that, though, I mean, again, I used to read all the Monk books. And I still have a few of those I still need to read. But And I don't have time to read anymore, unfortunately, either. I mean, it's I'm not sad about it because it's not like I'm, I, you know, because I do other stuff. I just do so much writing nowadays. I don't really have that much time to read. I'm trying to get back to doing more reading because I just love doing it, not for like school-related purposes. That too, but mostly just for personal leisure. 
Um, but yeah, I don't really read many books other than just the wrestling autobiographies, TV shows. Basically the same thing. I'm just wrestling 24-7. But, um, you know, if there is – I mean, I'm a huge movie fan. I watch movies that are not wrestling related, obviously. Not everything has to be about wrestling. Um, but yeah, no books right now other than just the wrestling autobiographies. I'm reading – Hoping to hope, hopefully hoping to start reading Jericho's book at some point in the near future. JTG's book online, a few others too, and uh, TV programs mostly just Raw. And I watch a few other shows if they're on. If my family's watching them or my roommates are watching them, I'll I'll tune in every once in a while. But other than that, though, I don't really watch much TV. Um, Ali STFU, their question was: Are you satisfied with wrestling, or am I the only one who is simply just not as interested as before? I'm satisfied with wrestling, but then again, I am a giant mark for wrestling. Not just for WWE or for TNA, for Ring of Honor, for Global Force, for Independence, for everything. For Lucha Underground, for every piece of wrestling out there. I'm a wrestling mark. I love wrestling. I will never stop love wrestling. I will never stop loving wrestling. I will only My love for wrestling will only continue to grow as the years go on. That's just me, though. Maybe it's because... I started watching at a time they went to PG, so I didn't know what it was like before that. Maybe it's because I started watching when I was 14. I didn't start watching when I was 8. And therefore, when all my friends fell out of it, I fell out of it too. I didn't have that. I had a completely different experience. Maybe that is why I'm still watching to this day. Um, and also, in addition to the fact I just do so much with wrestling in terms of my writing and all the other stuff that I do, there's no real way I'm ever going to stop watching. You know what I mean? That's just me, though. Um, but right now, I mean, people are going to maybe jump to conclusions saying just because of one... Bad episode of Raw last week that wrestling's going to start going to shit. Um, I don't th I mean, the fall seasons are, you know, notorious for being bad every single year. So I'm not saying that's, you know, that's not going to happen this year. I mean, there's a very good chance it will if last week's Raw was any indication. So I wouldn't jump to conclusions just yet. But then it always gets better. That's the thing. It always, for every down period there is in wrestling, it always gets better. As for every up period, it always gets worse every once in a while. It's never going to be consistently awesome. There is always going to be those peaks and valleys in wrestling. That's just the way it works. That's the way the business works. But if you're not satisfied with that, if you're not interested in wrestling, that's completely okay. I never chew people out for like, if you don't like wrestling right now, you're not a true wrestling fan. I don't give a fuck what you're satisfied with. That is completely up to you. If you don't like Raw, that is totally fine. If you want to continue watching, that is completely, <clears throat> it's totally fine. <clears throat> if you don't want to stop, you know, if you do want to stop watching wrestling, that's totally fine too. It's all up to you and what you personally enjoy. Just pick and choose what you like. I know a lot of people that watch Raw only on Hulu nowadays because they can't stand the three-hour format. They just watch the 90 minutes on Hulu. I just can't do that. I like the three hours. Well, it is long. I'm not saying I agree with the format, but I'll sit through the three hours. It's a Monday night tradition for me. I'll never miss an episode um, more often than not unless something big pops up or I just have to miss it. But, um, you know, I'm, not, I'm never going to stop watching. But, yeah, I'm, I'm satisfied right now. Wrestling, I think 2015 has been a great year for wrestling on the whole, in my personal opinion. I don't know about everyone else. But um, I feel like 2015 has been a great year for wrestling, for WWE. Maybe not so much for TNA, but, uh, you know, Lucha Underground, the rise of Global Force, they're just kind of getting underway. Ring of Honor as well. So, yeah, I'm satisfied with wrestling. Um, at RJ underscore Marceau, RJ Rocks, R. J rocks. That's our chant that we got going now. Just listen to that on WrestleRant Radio. We're going to start that chant going around now. <laughs> um, his question was, if Seth Rollins retains both titles on Sunday, would he continue playing? Would he continue pulling double duty at upcoming pay-per-views? That's a good question. I would think so. Um, there's always the chance they don't have him, re you know, have him um, defend the U.S. title on every single show. But I feel like it'd be cool. I know Ring of Honor is doing it. I'm not saying. You know, that, that's basically what I'm saying. WWE should rip off Ring of Honor. And I'm not saying do it, you know, WWE does not copy storylines. They've copied from TNA. They've copied from Ring of Honor. This whole storyline is, Ring of Honor started a couple months ago with Jay Lethal. Let's face it. TNA copies WWE a lot more than the other way around, but every, com every company copies each other. They copy from history. Nothing's original anymore for the most part. There's just you're picking and choosing from other wrestling promotions. Just WWE happens to be doing it the same time the Ring of Honor is doing it. Um, instead of waiting to do it, they did it at the same time they're doing it with Jay Lethal. But anyway, my point, the point I'm trying to make here is that J Jay Lethal is still defending both belts on Ring of Honor TV. He's still doing it on pay-per-views. He's doing it at the upcoming pay-per-view, I think, this week against the uh, both members of Red Dragon, the TV title and the world title that same night. So I would love to see Rollins continue to do that. Um, in the months going forward. And like I said in an article last week for Bleach Report, if there's any one guy to pull double duty on every pay-per-view for a couple of months, 
It's Seth Rollins. The guy is an amazing worker, an amazing worker, and will get great matches out of whoever he faces. So um, I feel like he'd be the perfect guy. And I, yeah, I think if he does retain both titles, which would be awesome, he should continue to pull double duty. Um, we can get more fresh matches. We can get more of Rollins, twice as ro much of Rollins as we usually get, and um, two times as more amazing matches. Uh, next question from Matt Hale Zeppelin. Does it bother you that Sting does not have his WCW theme? Not really. And the only reason I say that is because I never, I never watched WCW. I started watching in 2008. And um, his WCW theme was cool, um, but I'm just not as attached to that theme as many people are because I never watched WCW. I was never—I mean, I am now watching Nitro episodes, but you know, as a fan growing up, I never—I didn't watch wrestling until like 10 years afterwards, so I was not as attached to that theme as many people were. I like the current theme. I think the current theme is great. Some people argue the old theme is better than this one, which is probably true. I don't know. I just really like this theme that he has now. I feel like it fits his personality to perfection. Um, a second question, is the statue being focused on way too much? I don't think so. I mean, they did it for the one night when Rollins, you know, first got the statue, the night after SummerSlam. They didn't mention it last week, and they brought it back last week to, um, um, they didn't mention the week after that, and they brought it back last week for Sting to destroy it. And, um, and things get destroyed all the time. It's basic, a basic way of furthering the feud between Rollins and Sting without having Rollins wrestle, so I guess it was unique in that respect. I don't think it's get, getting focused on way too much. If they bring it back this week, then maybe. But they're not focusing on it um, any more than they were the, the whole Cadillac storyline they were doing with J&J Security and Lesnar and Rollins a couple months ago. It's basically the same exact thing where Rollins' opponent destroys whatever prize possession he has and um, we get the remnants of the car and everything else in the next couple weeks. So if they bring it back tonight, maybe. But it's, they're not focusing on it any more than they were the whole car thing a couple months ago. At Unsolved22, do you have any favorite pay-per-view posters? Very good question. To my memory, no, because I feel like if I did, I would have a poster of it. Like I would have tried to get a copy or something. Uh, it's weird, too, because even my favorite pay-per-views are um, like Money in the Bank 2011, my favorite pay-per-view of all time. The poster for that show sucked. It was like Big Show reading nighttime stories, like bedtime stories to Hornswoggle. Like, what the fuck? Like, who would come up with something like that? It wasn't... I don't, it was bizarre. I don't know why that was the way it was. And it's, it's funny. The, my favorite pay-per-view of all time is easily the worst pay-per-view poster I've ever seen. How weird is that? Anyway, um, on that same token, though, my favorite show of all time, along with Money in the Bank, NXT TakeOver Brooklyn. And um, you can't see in the frame, but I do have it hanging up. I posted a video blog about it on my Facebook page if you want to check it out from a couple of days ago. Um, but the poster for that show, it's like I they were selling it on the shirts where they show all the matches for TakeOver and the NXT show they tape before the before the event. They're all on the poster. And um, I have that poster. It's hanging up here in my dorm room, like right beside me. You can't see it in the frame. But that's a great poster. And it reminds me of what an amazing night that was. Um, Pay-per-view posters... Again, the only one that comes to mind is the one for Night of Champions 08. And the only reason I can remember that one is because I think I said it as my screensaver for a while, like when I first started watching wrestling. That was when I first started watching. And I love the concept that every title was on the line. Like, Night of Champions was my favorite pay per view for a long time. Uh, for like a couple of years, the Night of Champions was my favorite pay per view, and they finally changed it. Um, I mean, I finally changed like my ranking and my favorite shows because Night of Champions kind of went to poop after a while. There's only a very. Only a, a very, a very like a, a handful, not even a handful, very few Night of Champions shows that are good to great. Most of them are kind of throwaway, in my opinion, or that's what it's basically become in recent years. But um, the pay-per-view poster for Night of Champions 08, very timely with the pay-per-view being this Sunday, but that pay-per-view poster had every current champion on the on the poster. You had Edge and Triple H and Mickey James and Matt Hardy and... Miz and Morris. I thought it was cool to see all of them on the same poster. I love that poster so much. So probably that one, if, um, if I do have any one favorite pay-per-view poster from WWE history. Um, at Call3121, would, you, would wrestling skills be more important than the hardcore violence that once a hype years back? Um, so I'm not exactly sure what you're trying to go for in the final few words there. You kind of lost me. I don't know what you're trying to say. Um, if you're trying to ask, are wrestling skills more important than hardcore violence? I would absolutely say so. I mean, I know that was the whole thing in the Attitude Era, especially in ECW. And ECW is great and all just for the whole vibe and the electricity that crowd brings. But just me personally, it's all subjective, but just for me personally, 
I'm just not a huge fan of all the hardcore, super violent shit. Like, when we get a good no-holds-barred match every once in a while that means something, and it's for a meaningful feud, I'm a huge fan of it. But if we get hardcore matches every single fucking week, <clears throat> TNA, it just becomes unbearable. Like, it just loses luster after a while, and they don't mean anything. And the thumbtacks, I'm like, I'm not a fan. I think that's way too much. I think the... The people that are doing it, I appreciate their love for putting their bodies on the line for this business and for us. I am truly grateful for that, but sometimes they go over the limit with the shit they do, and I know they used to do that in ECW and CZW. Maybe they used to do that back in the days, and hopefully they don't do that anymore. A lot of that stuff is just a little too much, even for a, a, a diehard wrestling fan like me. But yeah, I feel like wrestling skills are a lot more important than just the hardcore violence that we used to see many years back, as you said. At Sheen Marcus. Um, his question was, push repackage release Ryback, Owens, and Cesaro. Again, kind of an easy one. I would push Owens. I feel like I, he just needs... Again, push and repackage are kind of interchangeable in this in this question as well. I would repackage Cesaro. All these guys have great gimmicks, so I wouldn't change anything about them. But just for the sake of the question, um, you can interchange either of them. But I did put down push Owens, repackage Cesaro, and release Ryback. Huge Ryback fan. You will not find a bigger Ryback fan than I. Just the only thing is that of the three, he, he's probably never going to make it to main event. Um, I mean, Cesaro, maybe the same thing can be said for him too. But I feel like there is still hope for him to become a world champion in WWE. Same thing with Kevin Owens. So I'm not, not going to give up hope on either of those guys just yet. So I would push Owens, repackage Cesaro, and re release Ryback. Um, once again, from at E13A, his question was, Sad question, name three wrestlers any company who have the most depressing careers right now. Sad question, but a good one. Um, I will say Damian Sandow. The guy went from easily the most depressing career right now. The guy went from being the top of the heap in um, at the, earlier this year, the most popular guy arguably in the entire company at the start of 2015. Months later, he's not even on fucking TV. How does that even happen? How does that even happen? The guy has not been seen on Raw in like four months. No shit. No joking. No joking. You go back to... I feel like the last Raw appearance he made was when he debuted the Macho Man Dow gimmick um, right before Payback. They lost that match to the Ascension. They have not been seen on Raw since. It's awful. Absolutely awful. Um, yeah, Damian Sandow, above and beyond, so depressing. Adam Rose, too. I just see that guy come out for, like, Superstars matches and main event and whatever. And I'm just like, really? It's so sad, especially after the whole ESPN thing aired and the guy had so much positive feedback from that show, from that special, and they just paired him with Rosa Mendez. That was their bright idea. And he's doing nothing getting, He's doing nothing now. The whole bookworm gimmick, I feel like, is so limited and cliche and stupid and just... I don't know. His his career is depressing, too, if only for the whole ESPN thing, that whole buzz from earlier this year. I couldn't think of a third guy. I, I put a couple dots because I was going to go back and um, think of a third guy. I just forgot. I would put the entire state of TNA right now. TNA is pretty depressing at the moment, so you can pretty much put anyone in that company on this list. But in all seriousness, no. I, I, in all seriousness, though, I would probably put maybe Fandango. Um, again, one of the most over guys in 2013 for a time anyway, right after WrestleMania. Got injured, came back, job guy. And he's still doing this dancer gimmick. Like, how is that still a thing in 2015? I understand it turned him babyface. Bravo, something new. That's good to see. But just, it's not getting over. People do not care. Why is he there? Why, why is he still doing the Fandango gimmick? Repackage him. Repackage Rose. Repackage Sandow. Repackage all these motherfuckers because it's just... Depressing to watch them, as you said, um, in 2015, just seeing them. Sandow's not even on fucking superstars when these guys are. How does that just doesn't make any sense? Hashtag where's Damien Sandow? Let's get that trending right now, people. Hashtag where's Damien Sandow? It's just fucking mind blowing, I tell you. Anyway, moving on to our final question from at C Rhodes underscore T Wilson. Will Cody Rhodes ever return? Yeah, I feel like at some point he will. Um, I feel like Cody is very comfortable in the Stardust gimmick. That's not to say that's the reason why he's doing it. Um, I know there was an argument a while ago from someone that said, you know, the whole reason why he's not Cody Rhodes anymore is because he likes doing the Stardust thing. That has nothing to do with it. Just because he likes doing it doesn't mean that if WWE wanted him to be Cody Rhodes, he would be fucking Cody Rhodes. They just have no plans for him right now, so why would they turn him back into being Cody Rhodes if they have no plans for him. If he's going to be doing the same thing he's doing right now, then I don't care to see him turn back. Unless they have some meaningful plans for him to be an upper mid-card, uh, a basic mid-card, or just do something meaningful. Upper, upper mid-card, if not main event, then don't bother turning him back into Cody Rhodes because um, Stardust thing, he has finally found his niche. He has found his groove with that character, which is great to see. I love Cody Rhodes a lot more than Stardust, but his final, at least he's finally 
finding his own. He's, he's really coming into his own, um, finding his stride as Stardust. But I feel like, as I've said time and time again, the money lies within Cody Rhodes. He is the true moneymaker, not Stardust. But personal opinion, but will he ever return? I feel like he will at some point, just not at any point soon. We've heard no teases of it, no... No signs pointing to a Cody Rhodes return, so I will not get your hopes up at any point in the near future. But down the line, maybe even before he retires, <laughs> even if it's 10 years down the line, um, I do get a feeling we will see Cody Rhodes in WWE again. So that's going to close out today's edition of Hashtag Ask JSM. Thank you guys for sending your questions as always. As I said earlier at the start of the video, we are quickly closing in on 100 episodes. It's amazing to think we ever got that far. I've been doing this since July of 2013. And the only reason the show has gone as long as it has is because of you guys, your support, your sharing of the video, your sending in of the questions, everything. So continue to do that. It, com it means a lot to me. I completely appreciate it. It's awesome. You guys are the best. But in the meantime and in between time, you guys can tweet your questions to moi to answer in next week's video. Um, you can tweet me on the Twitter at WrestleRant with the hashtag AskGSM. Find me on Facebook, give the page an old thumbs up, and put the question on the post I usually put up on Sunday nights, or on the wall itself at Facebook.com backslash Graham.GSM.Matthews. Or if you don't have a Twitter, you don't have a Facebook, or if you don't just care to contact me through either of those social media services, you can leave a comment down below on this very video. I'll be sure to include your question in next week's edition. So with all that being said, guys, hopefully you guys are doing well. Enjoy the rest of your week. Enjoy Raw tonight, which will hopefully be good. Crossing fingers, crossing fingers. Tonight's show is going to be a good one. I have hope. Looking forward to Night of Champions this upcoming Sunday. Send in your questions for Night of Champions after the event if you wish. Um, I will not be answering who do you think is going to win this match because the uh, these videos are taped on Monday mornings more often than not. So be sure to send those in on Sunday night if you want to have any Night of Champions related questions in next week's video. So with that said, guys, again, have a great one. Enjoy the rest of your week. I'm Graham Jason Matthews, and I'll catch you guys down the road.